I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design with an exceptional architect emanating from Dallas, Texas, Eddie Maestri of Maestri Studio. I, I have known Eddie for a while, and I'm a huge fan. I think by the end of this episode, you will be too. <laughs> I don't normally do this, but here's just a bit from Eddie's bio. Eddie Maestri, AIA, a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, started designing homes in Dallas in 2004 and officially founded Maestri Studio in 2008. Certified by the National Council of Architecture Registration Boards, he is a registered architect in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Nevada. Eddie holds a Bachelor of Environmental Design and a Master of Architecture from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas, with a certificate in health systems in design. In addition, he spent a semester in Italy focusing on architectural and urban studies, as well as expanding his talents and love of freehand drawing, art, and interior design. We talk about this, and um, Maestri is highly skilled as architect, designer, and storyteller. You're gonna hear from Eddie right after this. I am incredibly proud of Convo by Design in year 10, and I'm equally proud of my partnership with Thermosol. They've been presenting partners of Convo by Design for three years now, and there is a certain amount of pride that comes with saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. Thermosol engineers the most exceptional smart shower products and steam shower systems worldwide for a few reasons. They were the first company to design patent the technology here in the U.S. dating back to 1958. Thermosol, a U.S. brand, a U.S. manufacturer in Round Rock, Texas, employs an engineering team that designs, tests, and continuously refines the product. Their quality control team tests every single steam generator before it departs the factory. Who else does that? Nobody. I have had the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me and you probably know this, that the idea of luxury has changed and continues to change, especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory. Or it's just not considered a, a, a luxury space. And if you want to add steam, you have one true option. It's Thermosol. And now, Thermosol, the industry leader in steam, bath equipment, and technology since 1958, is enhancing their already stellar family of products with new indoor and outdoor luxury saunas. Available in three design configurations, each sauna is handcrafted from clear western red cedar or Nordic spruce, inspired by the brilliance of northern European sauna technology and design. A luxury bathroom isn't luxury without steam. If you want luxury, you have one option. It's Thermosol. Check them out at thermosol.com and at thermosol on the social. So Eddie, you and I, um, we've been talking, gosh, for years. We've been trying to, I've been trying to get you on the show. So I appreciate the time today. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's funny too. When I look at your website, it, it reminds me, cause I think, are you in Dallas? I am. Yeah. So I'm from LA, but I'm in Tulsa working on this design house project. And the first thing, you know, when I look at you on your website and I see you with your boys in front of the lights at LACMA, yeah. that is, that is one of my favorite things. Um, I, I love that display be just because of everything it represents. And that's kind of what I wanted to enter into, like, and how to start with you, you know, you started your company at arguably the worst time in financial history to start a company. Absolutely. 08, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And the manner in which you did it, because you've got the architecture side and the design side. Take me back there for a second, will you? Take me back. And do you remember what was going through your head? Like, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to make this work? And then, you know, sort of using today to sort of inform the Eddie back in 08, what was going through your mind then? And what were yeah, you thinking? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was honestly terrifying. Um, I, you know, I had worked for another firm for a while and I was doing multifamily design and it, it wasn't what I always wanted to do, um, but it paid the bills and that was important, obviously. Um, and I had started doing one-off uh, renovations and new build plans around Dallas with different builders. And I really enjoyed it. It was really what I wanted to do. Um, in a way, it started as me wanting the neighborhood architecture to be better. So I was doing it just as, you know, hey, this is a fun thing for me to earn extra money on the side. 
Um, but starting, you know, officially jumping out and starting, you know, Maestri by itself was something that I was every month, you know, oh, next month is the day, you know, like I'm going to do it next time, you know, and, and, you know, incorporated everything and, in, you know, let's say April and with the intent that, hey, by May 1, I'm going to be on my own, hit the ground running. And then, of course, as I'm making all these plans, you know, the markets are just, everything is just going south. And I, um, it took kind of a kick in the rear, honestly. I, I got laid off from my other job in a massive layoff. And I felt that at that moment, it was just a sign, hey, this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, and I, I went home, I, I called every builder or designer I had been working with. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm full time now, you know, send me, send me work. Um, so it was really scary, but <clears throat> the crazy thing was that, you know, it gave me a lot of confidence because I was able to start the business during that time and, you know, to be successful. And, and I often think back on that a lot when, you know, business is always a risk and it's always evolving and it's always a curveball. And I think back on that, you know, that period and that, hey, you know, just kind of keep the faith in a way and say, hey, you know, it's it's all about it's a problem that we can solve. You know, um, it's just like kind of like a math problem. You know, we just kind of figure out what the best course of action is at the time and take some chances and do our best. Did you say you were in Dallas at, the, at that time? Yes. OK, so. Um, I first moved to Dallas in the mid nineties and moved back. Oh, three to Oh, seven, Oh, six. So I was there just before you started. Sure. Um, Dallas is one of my favorite cities in the country. And I cannot imagine a better market for, for someone like you to start your firm and I, it, what's really interesting about it is we're kind of back there again a little bit. So I wanted your take on this. Yeah. We're kind of back there a little bit, like post pandemic. People are, you know, look, I, I'm a native Angelino and I'm in Tulsa. People are, are still moving around and they're realizing that, hey, I don't have to stay put. I can go somewhere else. Sure. Growing up in LA, the architecture and design scene there is very, um, I don't want to call it cyclical, but because it's so artistic in nature, you know, you have things that are there and then they come down. I was telling a story a while back about this, this Beverly Hills project, North Roxbury, 1001 North Roxbury. I don't know if you heard the episode, but I covered the, uh, I covered the city council meeting. They demolished this, uh, this guy, um, major uh, tech guy comes in, buys this property for like $40 million, tears it down. It was an LA, it was an iconic LA piece of property. But that's just kind of the deal. In Dallas, you're tearing down terrible properties from the 70s, you know, or, or there's still infill project, you know, space available to do something remarkable. And the city has just kind of, it keeps emerging as something brand new. How did, how did that inform the manner in which you started your firm? So I, I grew up in New Orleans and I always loved I've always loved old buildings. I think, you know, for me, it was always about, you know, the story of who lived there, how many people live there, you know, things that happen there. I feel like life happens at a, in a home, right? And when I came to Dallas, I naturally gravitated towards the old areas of the city. And that's, that's where I started my roots um, in East Dallas. And um, I, you know, just fell in love with those old homes. And a lot of them, you know, were 1920s, 30s, 40s bungalows. And they started coming down left and right. And, and that was one of the moments that it really, it really kind of struck me as like, I can do better than what is being replaced on these lots, you know? And that was actually my first new build as I, I saw the plans of a neighboring house and I offered to do it for free. I said, I, I, I think I can do a better job. You know, like, please don't build this on this lot. Um, so in a lot of ways, Dallas has lost so much of its history. And I, I am a big preservationist. Um, I love new construction. We are really good at it. Um, but I always feel like 
that's not the whole story. Like the, the fabric of the neighborhood is important. So a new, a new building should fit in. And Dallas does have a lot of, um, a lot of land, but the city core um, is coming down left and right. I mean, there are beautiful historic homes in Highland Park that are coming down. There are, you know, just different crazy nice houses that are in buildings that are coming down just as a numbers game. So, um, you know, coming from New Orleans, that's something that I always kind of believed in. And when I started designing here in Dallas, it really, I think, struck a chord with people who were moving from other cities that liked the work and liked the scale and that it was different and that it was more thoughtful. Um, and in the first few years, you know, um, 08, 09, and 10, I actually had a lot of cl new clients from other cities that were frustrated with what they were seeing here and um, potentially moving from New Orleans even and saying, oh, I really like that what you're doing is not the style that's all over the city, which in, in some cases is very um, unthoughtful. Tell me about style too, because it's really interesting because from yeah. what I, you know, living in, in Dallas, as long as I did and what I know about it, you know, Dallas is one of those cities. Texas is one of those states. It, the South is one of those regions where it's brick. It's, it's a traditional, uh, you know, historically speaking, um, sure. it, it's, it's traditional in nature. It's, um, it's hard. It's hard to move the design needle. And I think in part maybe, and I, I want your take on this, but maybe it's because, you know, it's part of what, what I've always called the design flyovers, right? Unless you're LA, San Francisco, New York, Boston, Chicago, Miami, you know, you're, you're really getting, you're not getting the, the editorial coverage. I've often joked about it. It's just so funny to me that of the AD 100, you cannot possibly tell me the best architects and designers in the world, you know, 80 plus percent of them are all in New York. I'm sorry. You just can't tell me that. But I think sure. that be, that's the philosophy is that it's easier to get coverage or it has been easier to get coverage from, from the, the primary, the heavily focused design cities. But Dallas is one of those where it, it's very accepting. Um, did you find it was your, your style? And we're going to dig into some of your projects in a bit, but did you find yeah. that your style, and, and I don't mean your, like your personal style, I mean the, the manner in which you create was readily acceptable or accepted, or did you, did you have to sort of sell it? I, I think that in general, um, I really pride myself on we work with every style and we take each project on a case by case basis as to how we treat the design. So I think, you know, I'm sure over the course of looking over all of our work, there's a common thread and a common, a common style that will come up. But I think what was really accepted was that we, make a very conscious effort for every house to look different, for every house to be unique to the neighborhood and fit in. And, and we do a lot of work in conservation, historical, um, and even, you know, the modern, the modern work, you know, we're, we're taking a, almost like creating a story, you know, maybe it was built at a, you know, 20 years ago and not right now. So we are, we're always kind of changing that style. So I think in, in the sense of what client feedback has been and what, you know, what I hear from other people um, in the neighborhoods and everything is that, yeah, they, they love that the houses have character, um, they, they fit in, the scale is thoughtful. Um, and of course, you know, every job is a little bit different, you know, and we could sometimes have clients that, you know, fight us on, on that and the house kind of changes. But I think the style overall is very, um, it's always very different. And I would say, you know, as a course of like the architecture community in Dallas, I'm probably, I probably use a lot more detail than a lot of the architects like, um, but I, that's just kind of who I am and, you know, my background and where I grew up. And I, I think that, you know, detail really kind of tells a story and makes people feel at home. Um, and I think it's, you know, Dallas in general as a city doesn't really have a style. It, it's, it's a hodgepodge. And you know, if you look at cities across North America, you know, the, the prominent style is typically when the city boomed. You know, I mean, just what period did that city 
find find itself and to kind of find its soul. And I think Dallas is a fairly young city. Um, there's been definitely different periods of boom. And I think we're seeing that struggle here with the infill, you know, that areas that were, you know, booming in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and it's shifted all over are, are being demolished and kind of rethought. And I think Dallas is one of those cities that is still trying to find its identity in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, it's funny. It's sort of like tinker till you destroy it is kind of is kind of like, look, I, I will tell you, I haven't been back. Um, I was there for West Edge, um, but I didn't get to travel around a little bit because I was doing so much, so much of the programming. But like Deep Ellum, you know, Deep Ellum is one of my. But I have, I have deep roots, and 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 I love Deep Ellum because um, I'm a I'm a jazz fan, so I love the history and the deep, rich history of Deep Ellum and a music scene. For those not familiar, check the show notes. You'll learn all about Deep Ellum in in Dallas. It's amazing. But also that's because where, I was that's in, where our studio is. Is that right? Yeah. So okay, so I was in radio in the in the mid 90s and and working for the stern show but i was also the music rep for a radio station called the edge and so i was you know it, four nights a week i was in deep vellum at one of the clubs i mean i'm sure you know maybe trees is still there maybe a couple of, of other stalwarts are still there but most of them i'm sure are are long gone but you know you take an area like that that has such deep rich history and you just keep tweaking it until eventually all the history is gone and it's it's a homogenized version. And then it gets really popular and everybody loves it. And it's like, well, OK, whatever. But something you said, I kind of want to drill down on a little bit. And that is your your personal style. I, I have I have long held a, a philosophy that it's, you know, the the best and most amazing creators I know. It's you may have a personal style and that's what's behind you because that's your house. Right. Right. But, it ultimately, it really doesn't matter to your clients what your style is. And you know that your, your role and your job and your purpose is to find their style and take your skill set and craft to their style. But what, what I have always found that remains relatively consistent is that through line. It's like a fingerprint where, you know, and again, we'll look at some of your projects and I, I'll, I'll see them. And it's amazing to see how some of these through lines, some of the things that you do that, all, that, that are recurring elements in your work, it's all different because it's not part of the style, but it's still there. It's like little Easter eggs. And, and that's one of the things that I absolutely love. How did, how has Dallas and that, that ephemeral, transitional, temporary kind of, and Dallas really is that way, you know? Sure. And I think that's one of the things that I actually really like about it is it's not afraid to change. And I think it's not like Austin in that it doesn't have such a deep, rich history that you're really worried about taking anything of, of significant value down. They're just, it just doesn't really seem to exist there. Or am I completely off base? I, I think it does have a lot of significance. Um, I think it's something that at first pass you might not see, but um, you know, we lost most of our downtown um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, I mean, coming from a city like New Orleans where, you know, buildings are, are so old, I mean, hundreds of years, it's, it's a little bit, you know, heartbreaking, you know? So I know, um, you know, parts of Dallas, such as like, you know, Old Swiss Avenue, um, you know, I've always just been in love with those areas. And, and I think that it, it's something that in Dallas you have to fight for. You have, you know, the preservationists have to really speak up and kind of make a point. But it gets eye rolls because Dallas is a business city. People people want to make money. Um, I mean, the house that I'm sitting in now was um, really advertised as a teardown, and which <laughs> is unbelievable to me. Um, so I think that it's something with style. We really, you know, in our studio have just let's pull from all over. You know, let's let's pull from our clients past where they lived what speaks to them you know um i do pro i do have a lot of easter eggs you're right um you know i always have little things that have inspired me from travels all over the world from growing up in new orleans that i i kind of you know put into houses in new ways um because i think it is a it is a common language you know it's it's spaces that make people feel feel good um but i think with a lot of our our clients you know, moving to Dallas for, you're right, maybe, maybe it's their long-term home, maybe a few years. 
um, our clients are willing to take some risk and, and do something different and, and try it and try new things. And um, I think that's important, you know, is to kind of be bold and trust your architect and designer. One of the things that I think is, is really unique and wonderful too um, is the strength of the design community. And, and I, it, it is amazing there. Tell me about yeah. that. And, and was it like that when you started or is it something that just sort of came along gradually? Um, I would say it's something that I had to find my part in. I mean, I think there's different, um, you know, there's different generations of designers, you know, and I think um, the more, the more designers that I have met and architects that I've met and formed relationships with, I think the more even confident it has made me and on my work. Um, not, not in that it's, it's uh, a competition at all. It's just that we get, to, we get to really bounce ideas off of each other and talk about challenges and just really feel empowered, you know, just that, hey, you know, this other person's dealing with the same business issue that we are or hiring issue or client issue. Um, so I think it's a really good community. And it, it's definitely um, gotten better and better since I've been here. And, and from your perspective, so like since, you know, in a, in a post-pandemic design world, do you find yourself focused more on North Texas, Texas in general, Southwest, South, Southwest? Are you, are you expanding? Is that the goal? You know, this is more a question about the firm itself and having, sure. ha having realized that we don't have to stay localized anymore. Like we may have felt we had to in the past. How has that sort of affected your reach out, your outreach rather, and what you want to do and where you want to do it? I, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, coming through the pandemic and, and kind of a lot of things happening at the same time, you know, our project reach, I, I think just happens to coincide, you know, with where we are as a firm just happens to coincide with the pandemic and, um, and our clients and where they are. So we, we've noticed in the past few years, that we have a lot more projects outside of Dallas. And, mm. and they're all over. So, um, you know, we have jobs in Austin, we have jobs in Fort Worth, um, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Nevada, New Orleans. Um, and, you know, we just had a call yesterday with inquiry from Kentucky. And, I, and I'm finding that one of the things that I think did come out of the pandemic in general is that a lot of people, a lot of consumers and customers and clients really are leaning more on Instagram to to find sourcing and everything. Cause that was their tool while they were at home. Um, and so many of our clients now find us online and on, and on Instagram. And, and that's what we're seeing as a big driver. And it's hard to say, does that coincide with just where we are as a people now with technology? Was it the pandemic? You know, is it just that our work is now getting that much attention? It's really, it's really hard to say. Um, but I would say, you know, our goal as, as a firm is that we do want to be, have more of a broad reach. Um, you know, California, Southern California has always been my happy place. So, I mean, would I love to have more work there? Absolutely. Um, you know, and of course, you know, having jobs in my hometown is amazing too. You, you mentioned the, for, for lack of a better word, this Instagram effect. So sure. social media is, is not new. And, you know, it can no longer be called modern technology or new technology. It, it is what it is. But, the, but what's interesting is I feel like the way people are using it now, um, and not just clients for designers or architects, but also architects and designers in specifying product for their projects, has completely transformed the way you do business. And I'm curious how that's opened things up for you as far as new product creation, new, new product discovery, um, use of new products, use of new technology. Has that, how has that expanded the, the scope of, of the business? I mean, it has tremendously. I mean, I, it's all at, you know, your fingertips. I mean, I, um, I will find something, you know, for example, a new product online and send it in one click to our client and 
you know, our team members. Um, and it's, and it's really helped too, for how we communicate with clients. I mean, you know, we don't rely on Instagram, but I feel like so many people are on Instagram. You know, we've started our own, um, you know, mastery private client so that our Instagram, our, our customers and, and clients can start using that as a tool for sharing their inspiration with us, you know, and creating folders for them so that we can thumb through them. And then, you know, as they're sitting in bed or in traffic, Hey, boom, we get it immediately. Um, it, it has been life-changing. And I, and I think that, you know, exposing us also to other parts of the country and other products that are available <clears throat> so quickly. It, yes, of course, it, it's, it's definitely changed our entire probably design philosophy and what we're, what we're comfortable using. You are listening to my chat with an exceptional creative, Eddie Maestri. We'll be right back. Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery style space with a thoughtful display of products purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery. High-end faucets, luxury tile, natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration, collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. Well, I feel like it, it's had to, and one of the things that it's done is it's just made everything so much smaller and so much more immediate. And by the way, you, said stuck, in, you said stuck in traffic. Don't, don't Instagram <laughs> uh, your designer while you're while you're stuck in traffic, don't, well, text, you know. don't text and drive. Um, but but I think with that, I'm in the carpool line for a long time. So. <laughs> but seriously, um, what I find so interesting about it is the language of architecture, the the narrative of design, and the re- rapidity in which we used to have these same conversations. And now the language is, I, want, I, I don't want to say that the language has changed because I don't think it has, but I think a new shorthand has developed. And I think social media represents the shorthand in that conversation. And I think because sure. of that, things are moving so much faster. And now we find ourselves in this really interesting place. And I, I wanted to sort of talk to you about the business a little bit. Sure. You know, I feel like we're in, a, in an era where we're entering this bifurcated economy where you have both haves and have nots who still have a desire or haves and have have lesses who still have this desire to to do more extraordinary design and it's become democratized where because of social media you can see something and you can say i'd like that how do i do that okay if i can't do it at that at that price how do i get it for something that i can afford and this democratization of design it, it i I'm, i feel like it has it has made the industry so much stronger now we're on the precipice of AI and machine learning, yeah. where what that's going to do for the business is just extraordinary. How do you? So, someone who built your firm, you know, out of out of out of a fire. I mean, a, a dumpster fire that was the economy in oh seven, oh eight, oh nine, right? And now coming through a pandemic many years later, but well prepared for that. Sure. How does this next era? What does it make you, how does it make you think? How does it, how does it affect the way you want to move forward? You know, I think that it, it's always a guess, right? About what's going to happen next. And, um, and I, I think that, you know, kind of the, a little bit of the instability that we've seen in the past several months, you know, has made, you know, us look at our business and kind of what we, what do we want to do with it? And again, it kind of, it's, it's interesting how it's naturally coincided with, just the growth of our business and where we are at the time, you know? And I, I think that we, you know, have just looked at our jobs and, and what, which ones we enjoy and the kind of projects we want to do. And, you know, we, we do all of it now. I mean, we, we've make it, made it one giant, you know, design vision for the client. So, I mean, we start now from architecture, interiors, furnishing, furnishings, landscape, all of it. Um, and, and I think that, that might coincide with what you're saying with, you know, people, you know, are, are looking at now, you know, pictures of yards and pictures of 
furniture and all of it at the same time. And what we're trying to adapt to and our goal is to make it all come full circle and that we can address all of those needs for the client. And, you know, as far as, you know, economies of scale, I mean, like we, we always love a bargain. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always down for a bargain shopping event. Um, but yeah, I mean, to get the look and, you know, to find out how we can achieve that look for a client. I mean, it's, it's fun. And, and online and Instagram has been game changing. I mean, you can now image search something, um, you know, on Google and find out where to buy it or something like it within seconds. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. So this is, um, this is something that I really do. This is one of the things that I most enjoy actually is, and, and for those who are listening, you know where I'm going with this. Um, the, the project, uh, review that I love doing with creatives where we actually get to look at your work and, and yes, it is a podcast. So go to the show notes. There will be a link to maestrystudio.com. And we're going to, we're going to walk through a couple of these projects that I just absolutely love. And the first one that I wanted to start with, uh, Eddie is the Hill house. Yeah. Because as I, as I look at your work, um, wait, when was this one done? This was 2020. Okay, so as I look at your work, this particular house represents so many of those through lines that I had sure. that I had seen before, and yeah. that I really, really love about your work. And the the place I wanted to start with is probably the the least expected, but there's a powder bath with a botanical wallpaper that I absolutely love. And um, is it a, is it a powder bath or is it a? It is. Yeah. So. Here's what, here's why I actually wanted to start with that. There is so much to unpack in this small space, and it is extraordinary to me to, to put so much detail into a space that balances perfectly. I mean, when you now, I, I get that when things are shot, they're shot with a certain eye, but so as you sure. look at botanicals against a black wall and you look at the, the, the light colored marble and you look at the dark colored floor and you look at the lighting and you look at all of the different elements that went into this space, I imagine it's not a large space, but I think that's one of the challenges. If you can do an extraordinary small space, imagine what someone could do with a large space. Tell me about this powder bath. Tell me about the project as a whole and the, the personalities of, of the people for whom it was designed and what you were going for. So that, I was actually going to chime in and say so much of it goes, you know, to the client. Um, and, and I think that our, our client in this case was incredibly um, trusting with us and wanted to be bold and um, probably not surprising has a background in fashion. and you know, we, we really wanted to hit home on that. Um, and they had a great hand in it. You know, they had a good, you know, Hey, this is what we like. This is what we're willing to try. Um, but I would say, you know, our projects overall, you know, we can do very simple, but we really also love doing maximalism. And this is a great example of that and how all the details can fit together. Um, this house was a new build. Um, in a very well-established neighborhood, we really um, wanted to try to make something interesting for the lot that people would love. And, you know, kind of what I was saying earlier is that we wanted to kind of give it a story. So we kind of backdated the house a little bit. You know, we made it feel a little bit more early 70s, late 60s um, that had modern elements of today. Maybe it could have been remodeled. Maybe it was added on to. And, um, it was a very interesting shape lot. And, and I find that those challenges really give us the best in product. You know, we really have to think, we really have to find solutions and the shape of the house and everything, you know, it's a giant um, L shaped home. Um, you know, every, every room maximize, you know, maximizing light um, pattern, texture, warmth, all of it was very important to us. Yeah. And, and again, when it comes to small spaces, it's extraordinary. So from there, I kind of want to jump to what I'm going to assume is the master bath. And I absolutely love this space. Um, the, the tile is extraordinary, how it comes from, from the, the back wall of the shower. Now, question for you. Do you design your own shower enclosures? As far as being custom? As far as like the... 
okay, I could be totally off on this. I, I sure. just, I, I kind of feel like there is a, there's an art form to the shower enclosure. It's not Absolutely. just a, it's not just a glass box. It's really not. I mean, and especially now I can't tell, is this, I see floor to ceiling glass. Is this a steam shower? Um, you know, I honestly don't remember if it was a steam shower or not. Okay. I um, see floor to ceiling glass. So I'm, I'm assuming it might be, but I think I'm pretty sure it was. So what I'm assuming, you know, what I, what I'm kind of coming into this too, is it's one of those things where it's like, okay, it's a glass box where someone's going to get in and get out. We want to just make it look pretty, but that's not what someone like you does. You know, there is, there is seating to, to take advantage of. There's, there's perspective and view. There is, how does, how does one use that space? Can you enter and exit from both sides where it looks like in this case you can, Correct. um, there's a full size tub. There is just mm -hmm. the, the flow of this bathroom is just extraordinary to me. And, um, it's, it's so functional. This is done in 2020, right? So the right. planning had to be done ahead of time. So this is a post pandemic this is a pre-pandemic bathroom. Right. And many of the elements that you see coming out of a, you know, post-pandemic society, wellness and well-being in a spa-like bathroom seem to all be represented here. Um, they are. And I, and I think that's something that has been important to us for years, really. You know, um, natural light, how the space makes you feel, um, practicality. Um, I mean, this, this particular bathroom is exactly symmetrical. So that vanity is on the other side as well. Um, we created a his, hers um, area on here. So you can't enter the shower. You can enter from both sides. Um, and that shower, yes, everything is completely custom, you know, um, thought through as far as how we would make that shower and tub and tile the main feature of the space. And that's the main, that view that you see there is the main um, view walking into the space. I love that. And, and I, again, I'm making a couple of assumptions just because I'm not doing a walkthrough, but I'm, I'm going to assume that the, the, the bedroom um, with a similar tile, uh, the similar patterned uh, pillow is, is the bedroom adjoining that? Correct. So if you're standing looking at the tub, the bedroom is behind you. Love it. So in that, in that bedroom space, again, you tied in the modern elements, the, the millwork, um, uh, behind the bed, extraordinary. The the composition of the space um, is just again, it's it's comfortable. It's it seems. Do you like symmetrical spaces, or do you just seem to sometimes be given symmetrical spaces? No, I I definitely like symmetrical spaces, and I am really big on you know axes and center lines and viewpoints through a space. I think it um, is very important, and that. That probably goes back to a little bit of more classical homes that I've always been inspired by. And, you know, my studies in Italy and, um, you know, there are common threads like that, that I do impose across even very modern homes like this one. Yeah, I, I love it. And, and um, again, it's, it's the, the composition of it. And one of the other things that I, that I see as a through line is your, your relationship with, with art. And I know how how personal art in particular as it relates to design is to a to a client and i get that that in many if not most sometimes all cases the art is really informed um and selected and specified by the clients but do you take part in that process i i like to um you know i find that the clients with you know art is kind of a mixed bag of you know we've had this forever we collected it on a vacation or you know, hey, we really want the perfect piece for this room. Can you help us find it? Um, and I think it's all very intertwined. I mean, I, you know, I always say that, you know, art, you know, and architecture comes from really from, you know, starting a sketch, um, which can be inspired by really anything. Um, and I've always very much blurred the lines between, you know, art, architecture and design. So changing gears on you a little bit is, sure. uh, is, uh, via Cali. Um, yeah. it, that's in Preston hollow. That was a 2021 project. This was actually, um, it's my home and, Oh, <laughs> okay. It, um, this was actually a 
completely during pandemic project. Wow. All right. Okay. So, okay. So this is your, now, you know, what's really interesting. So I, I chose, I chose this one because I saw a lot of the, the very same through lines, but I will tell you, I saw a much more, a, a much bolder approach. And I was like, okay, there's something different about this one. Cause <laughs> you took, you took, you took, there was way more latitude taken in some of the, in some of the finishes. Oh, hundred percent. Okay. So this yeah. is you, this yeah. is you. Okay. Tell so me about this. This house was um, designed in 1969, finished in 71. And, um, you know, we, we bought this house right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was, it was really scary. Um, but the floor plan and everything really was exactly what we wanted. It was, you know, it's a um, kind of modernist, uh, formalist house. So it had a lot of, you know, the axes and symmetry that I love um, and the high ceilings and a lot of glass. So it was perfect. And, you know, I really wanted to just do bold and fun and make it, you know, unapologetically ours and, and just use um, furniture that we already had. I mean, almost everything in all of the photos, um, is, is what we had and, you know, in, in our former house, um, in a lake house that we had and we just merged it all together. Um, and yeah, I, I, I wanted fun. I wanted color. Um, I, I wanted it, you know, we have two, you know, two boys who are 10 years old. Um, I, I really wanted it to just be kind of a fun house and not feel, stuffy because i feel like if if the house didn't have all these crazy colors and patterns you know just the architecture in general could feel a little um a little flat um so i i wanted a ton of pattern you know it's very maximalist you know what's funny is and, and i think one of the reasons why i gravitated towards this project in particular is because it it reminded me my my grandmother had lampshades very, very similar. I, yeah. I know they're not the same lampshades. Yeah. But the the home, my neighborhood where I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, you know, in the 70s and 80s, was was dappled with with homes that looked like this. And there's a very comforting feeling to me in seeing that. I love everything, you know, down to the to the to the block behind the pool, you know, it's the the stone on the fireplace. I had that in my living room in the seventies, which, you know, which is really interesting because what you did here is you, you blended really, I mean, iconic features in a, of a, of a Southern California home in a Dallas home, which is amazing. But then there are other elements that you did like, like that, that, um, that bathroom with the green cabinetry and the wallpaper that is just amazing down to the, to the dining room where I'm curious, that ceiling is, is that vinyl? Is it patent leather? Is it, what is that? The dining room ceiling is, um, the, the one with the birds. No, the super gloss. Oh, the super gloss. That is, um, just lacquer. Oh, that's lacquer. Yeah. So every, everywhere in the house that had a lower eight foot ceiling, we lacquered white Man, to I maximize, love that. to bring in light. Um, so it's funny, uh, you know, I, I think I've always found kind of comfort in what we've kind of termed in the office lovingly as granny chic. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I remember, you know, <laughs> going to grandparents' homes that would have, you know, my grandparents in particular that would have had, you know, some things like this. And it just brings me a sense of comfort, you know, and um, I loved going as a kid, you know, to houses and kind of looking at elements that would have been there as, you know, my parents were even little and kind of the stories that, you know, come with it. I, I just love that. So I've personal style. I've always gravitated towards more of that mid-century and kind of um, in some ways tacky, um, you know, elements that just kind of bring joy. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, our, like I mentioned before, you know, Southern California, my, my family just loves, you know, my husband and boys and we get out there as much as possible. And we saw this house as an opportunity to really bring elements of um, California here to Dallas. Yeah. And, and by the way, Granny Chic, 
So I love that. And to be perfectly honest with you, I really, I wish I had my grandpa, my grandmother's uh, lampshades. There's a bunch of furnishings that my grandparents had that I, I wish I had today. Um, by the way, do you, are you still able, you know, I know that 10 or 15 years ago, you could go to Round Top or still pick around yeah. Austin at the flea markets or, you know, even down to Houston or Waco. Um, can, do you, can you still pick Texas or has it been pick clean? Um, yes. I mean, I think there's a lot to find. Um, we are actually going to round top next week. Um, oh, hoping yeah. to find, you know, some really interesting pieces. Um, I will say it's getting harder and harder, you know, to find good deals. Um, but there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of pieces, um, to find, I think. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting too. So again, being in, um, being in Tulsa, it's really interesting what you can find in Oklahoma. I, you know I what? I take that, that back. I take great. that back. Hold on. I take that back. There's nothing to find in Oklahoma. Really? Don't come here. Don't I come heard here that it, there were a lot of. Oh, no, yeah, no, no. Okay. Don't come looking in Oklahoma. People, anyone you. who's listening to this, don't come looking. In, there's nothing here. Nothing to see. Keep moving. Keep moving. All junk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, um, there really is. And we found some amazing there are amazing finds here. Not only have, have we found amazing things, but I've, I've also found amazing people and artisans. And I think that this is something that most people don't realize about. And this is part of Texas for sure. Um, you know, as, as wacky, weird, and wonderful as, as Austin is, the, the artistry and maker communities in all of Texas are just amazing, well into Louisiana and sure. um, Oklahoma and surrounding states. It's really, really very cool. What's also cool is how it changes by style. You know, you get into Arizona, you get one vibe. New Mexico, you get a completely different vibe. Texas, you get a completely different vibe. Louisiana, it completely changes. Oklahoma, I mean, it's just, a, it's amazing to me how much stylistically arts will change. Geographically, it's a long, it's a long stretch. But it's still kind of there's through lines in, in that it's the, the south and southwest, but it's amazing how different it can be. And you've kind of gotten into the whole art thing, art thing, too. How did that start? Absolutely. Um, I've always been into art. I, you know, from a very young kid, I mean, I was always painting and drawing. Um, we several years ago, we, we had um, an artist friend in the community that we brought into the office one day as just a kind of creative outlet we did a you know kind of a paint party there and everybody was so happy and inspired you know it was it was great um and i said you know why don't we do this more and it ended up turning into bringing art into the space into our studio as a gallery and and i and i've always found that you know it's all connected um you know the lines of a house are easily the same as lines as that inspires a painting you know all of that goes together um so I really, I really brought all that as um, kind of a creative outlet and inspiration for, for the team and for our clients as they come into the building. I love that. Um, last project I wanted to, to walk through with you because it is, it is a completely divergent philosophy for you is, sure. the Robin, is the Robin House. It looks like it was completed in 2019. Yeah. This is as, now I'm not going to go so far as to call it minimalist, but it is not maximalist. It, not is, it, it is not even a minimalist maximalist. It is, it is a, it is a very, it's, it's funny. It's, it's very subdued, which I think in that really draws out a lot of some of those through lines that we discovered, you know, that we, that we talked about earlier, like that, it, I guess it's the living room, which is just black and smoky and moody and completely symmetrical. And it, it seems like exactly the kind of place where you would want to hang out. Is that so a den or a living room? It's a, it's a good example of how we designed to the client. Um, this house was a 1940s cottage. It's, it was absolutely adorable and in great condition um, when our client purchased it. Um, and he was a bachelor and wanted it to feel very, you know, New York um, and clean and sophisticated. And one of the things that I loved about this house in general was that we really didn't have to alter the floor plan. Um, this particular room that you mentioned is um, 
just a very small den, which we made into really just kind of a small entertaining gathering space, you know, for cocktails and, and talk. And it, it's, um, it functions perfectly as that. Yeah. And as you get into the rest of the, the, the home, it is. So do you, do you, is there a story behind the LBJ art? Just curious. Um, our client got that and I'm trying to remember the story. And unfortunately I, I can't remember exactly, but there was a story about it. Um, but I can't remember where he found it. I mean, honestly, there has to be a story. If you want to have LBJ staring at you with the <laughs> side eye all the time, there's got to be a story behind that, right? Yes, for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, tell, me, tell me your thoughts on, because um, I, get, I get both sides of this, depending on who I'm talking to, your thoughts on accessorizing. Um. As, as to the amount of accessory okay. or? No, let me give you a little more detail as sure. far as where, where I'm going with this. Another um, kind of, uh, it, it is, accessorizing is a superpower. Access, accessorizing done correctly is, is really an art form. And I do feel like, you know, it's often, it's often very formulaic. In so far as like we put three, five, or seven, we put different heights yep. here, there, and there, yep. and it's symmetrical or it's asymmetrical, but it's asymmetrical on both the sides and then symmetrical in the middle. I think there are a lot of rules um, and a lot of if-then scenarios. But one of the things that I have noticed in, in your work is the, the nature of the accessorizing really does change based on each individual space. I've seen it done numerous ways and I've seen it done counterintuitively in some spaces and it's working absolutely perfectly, which kind of tells me that accessorizing is something you might take a little bit of pride in. I mean, and by the way, I don't mean that in the sense like you don't take pride in it if, if you do it like everyone else. I just mean it might be something that you pay a little bit closer attention to. It, it definitely is. I, I could say for... Um... You know, my own home, for example, I move things around all the time and I really hate rules. I feel like there shouldn't really be rules and how many, you know, vases you have on your on your island or anything. I, I think if it just looks right, it does. And I move it around a lot. Just it's really just about balance and, and how the light hits it. And, you know, it needs to be practical in all reality. I, I think that my favorite spaces that, um, you know, we've accessorized or that I see can be very practical and, and work and, and have accessories that are used. Um, you know, it's not just to look at and collect dust. So the, the last question I want to ask you is, is really, it's kind of an interesting one too. And it's, it's very regional and it's very geography specific. So, you know, Having lived in, in Texas, I can, I can tell you firsthand, I understand the weather. I understand the weather constraints. I understand the rapid weather changes. I understand the, the electrical grid system that people have to, have to be subjected to right now. You're an architect, designer, landscape architect. So you, you understand all of these different elements that, that go into not just inside the house, outside the house, structure of the home but full capabilities and full use of, of a home, which I think everyone has, has really come to, you know, clear-eyed, come to the vision that our, our homes have to be more performative than they have sure. been in the past. And because of that, you have to take into account outside factors, external factors, new technology. How do you, how do you design, you know, the, the parts of the home that isn't seen. It's not the pictures on the wall. It's not the millwork. It's not the furnishings. It's not the lighting, but it's all of it together, how it flows, how it's used, outdoor kitchen, indoor kitchen, um, maybe potential for off-grid activity. Because when the grid goes down, you don't know if you're going to, if you're going to be without power. I, I have family in Houston, you know, and, and when a tree comes down on a house uh, and, and tears down the, the, the light poles after a hurricane, could be weeks before sure. power's restored to the neighborhood. We kind of have to think about those things now. What happens if, you know, there's another pandemic? It's not if it happens, it's when it happens. It's going to happen again. And are those things 
do you think of the long-term implications of a family in a dwelling and and how do you how do you how do you emergency plan how do you how do you make the home as functional as it can possibly be well starting starting with design i mean our goal is really to design the palette is really the entire property and and how it's used and and what's available to use i mean you always have you know your functional space you always have your utilitarian spaces um but i think that the biggest thing for houses is the ability to be adaptable to change and and we often try to think through how can our designs be versatile going forward i think that's one of the things that you know covid living you know living through that whole period really taught was that you you need spaces that are versatile that can become a classroom and become an office and all of these different things. Um, and in that sense, we did see a little bit of, you know, a pretty big actually push away from the truly open, open concept of the kitchen right in the middle of the living room. It didn't work for us. That was part of the reason we moved. Um, but I think as far as, you know, systems and generators and all of those things with solar, the biggest thing for me is to make it a possibility in the future. Um, you know, as we're doing homes, budget is always on the forefront and those items are pricey. I mean, generators are very expensive. So, you know, we always make a space where they could go or, you know, Hey, if you want to adapt your house to solar down the road, when it's even more reliable, sure, that's going to work great. Um, and with weather, you know, here in Texas, storm shelter, um, where, where can it go? You know, um, and there's some really great options now that can be brought in and have spaces adapted. So I think having a home that can adapt um, is really is really the biggest thing. We do think about it during design, um, you know, and then like you said before, I mean, some people aren't intending to be in a house more than five to seven years. And they really don't care to see the investment, you know, for solar, you know, or, or things like that. Yeah, but it, it it has to go into the into the equation. To your point, um, sure, more more now than ever before. I think that's fascinating, uh, Eddie. This was great. I'm I'm so glad we we finally got a chance to do this. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. We are living at a time of incredible growth, both technologically and creatively, with respect to interior design, exterior design, and architecture. There is no question. There are companies thinking differently about the business of design and how to make products super serve those for whom they're being made. One of those companies, and one of my favorites, is Moya Living, designer and fabricators of some of the most stunningly beautiful, incredibly durable, and highly functional kitchen, bath, and outdoor kitchen cabinetry on the market today. Powder-coated steel with stunning lines, vibrant colors to fit any design style or aesthetic a history of designing cabinetry for the scientific community. So you know it's been tested in some of the truly the most harsh conditions available. Moya O'Neill is the CEO and founder of Moya Living. She's the inspiration behind the design. Designers, their specification process is so simple. It will make your job so much easier. Check them out online through the socials at Moya Living their website, moyaliving.com, and in the real world, their live kitchen showroom in Fountain Valley, California. Eddie, man, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really enjoyed our time together. Thank you to my partners and sponsors, Thermosol, Moya Living, and Design Hardware for your continued support of both Comfort by Design and the design community. A side note, the sponsors and partners you hear on Comfort by Design are more than companies with a product. Each of the partners I work with have been fully vetted They are owned and operated by people who love what they do and have dedicated themselves to serving the design community and consumers by providing the best products and services available. If you would like to know why I'm so proud to have have them as part of Convo by Design, email me at convobydesign at outlook.com or on Instagram at convobydesign with an X. I would be more than happy to share my experience with you. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. Until next week, be well and take today first.